What's up, you guys, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Fit Women's Weekly Podcast. I am super excited to be here with you guys today. I know that last week we had a guest on the show, which was so much fun. Hopefully, you've had a chance to go listen to that episode. If not, I will link it up right up here. And in this week's episode, I also have a guest. Today, we have Dr. Carla G. Girolamo. Say that one twice. (laughs) I've had to practice on that one. And we are going to talk about all things health and fitness as we get older. So I love this conversation because there's no outrunning time, right? (laughs) We're all going to be getting older at some point in our life. And as we do that, we need to learn how to optimally run our body and prepare for that. How should we work out in our 30s versus 20s and in our 40s and in our 50s and moving on? What are some of the things that we can expect from our bodies and what do we have control over? Because I know a lot of times as we get older, We just expect our muscle mass to reduce. We expect our fitness to go down. But really, what's the story behind all this? So Dr. Carla is going to come and join me. We're going to talk about it all. But before we do that, please make sure to give this video a thumbs up and make sure to subscribe to the channel. Every week, I put out multiple videos. I put out a brand new podcast every single week as well. And if you ever have a topic or a question that you would like to have covered on the show, just ask it down below. And if you'd love to support the show, here's what you can do. One, subscribe to the channel. That's the easiest thing to do, right? Two, if you want to hang out with me on a more personal level, start working out with me more, start getting trained, then find out about Fit Women's Weekly Live, which is my online training studio where every day I go live, not once, but twice every day of the week where I give a 30-minute workout and then a 60-minute longer version of that workout. So no matter how busy life is, if today is a training day for you, you can have something to do and you're gonna have it laid out in a very good way to get the results that you need. And then if you're like, Kendall, I really wanna support Phil Women's Weekly. I love this community that you're building, but I just can't be a part of that group right now. I understand that. Down below, you can find a link. There is a buy me a coffee. And then of course, just follow me on the social platform so that when you see content come up and you like it, just hit that like button. It really does help the channel and it helps build Fit Women's Weekly up because we're a pretty freaking awesome community. And I'm so excited to have you a part of that. All right, you guys, without further ado, let's jump in to this week's episode. I do not want to butcher your last name. And I do appreciate that everyone everything that on your website and your social media is Dr. Carla D because I'm assuming nobody can pronounce it. Yep. That's, <laughs> how that's you, about right. <laughs> yeah, so how do you pronounce? I it's, would even give it a go, but my Southern accent isn't going to give it justice. <laughs> that's okay. It's, it's D Geralimo. D Ger- Okay. All right. Yeah. So think about Geronimo, but with an L. So it's D, D Geralimo. D Geralimo. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> what is that Italian? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, where are it's you? My name. World? I didn't marry into that name. I, and I and I refused to give it up when I got married. So I would not give it up either. It's such a fun, like, <laughs> there's only one of you. <laughs> yeah, well, up where I live, there's actually a lot of us because I happen to still be in the same geography of when my Italian grandparents came over. Oh, cool. So where are you? Are you? I'm in Massachusetts. I'm in Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. And it is a blizzard outside right now. Are you serious? Mm, Yeah. (laughs) I don't know about you guys. So I'm East Coast as well. I'm in Charleston, down south. Oh, what a beautiful city. Charleston, South Carolina? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, love that city. I I went to medical school down at Wake Forest in North Carolina. And so I've taken some day trips to, uh, to Charleston. So yeah, love that city when I was there. Yeah. I was born and raised here. I'm kind of one of the few people that have stuck around, but you know, I feel like weather wise, you guys have the East coast stuff where you get that taste of spring, but you know, you're going to get that one last burst of winter. You know, you're like, Hey, that's what March is all about up here. (laughs) Exactly. So we don't have a blizzard, but we do have temperatures in the thirties tomorrow. So I'm pretty mad about that. (laughs) I don't blame you. My goodness. (laughs) But luckily we don't have a blizzard. So this is, Super laid back chit chat. I mean, I've already got it recorded and I'll cut and paste and I'll do an intro separate, but I just heard your podcast, like I said, and I was like, this lady seems obviously knowledgeable with your back and your history. But what I love is that you also promote the fitness and the strength side of things, which in today's society, you hear so much mixed information of like, don't do high intensity training. That's bad for your hormones. (laughs) Right. (laughs) <laughs> so before we get started, kind of quickly introduce yourself, uh, Dr. Carla, and explain to those listening, what is your specialty? What do you do? 
Sure. So I am a reproductive endocrinologist, which is a subspecialty of obstetrics and gynecology, which is women's health, essentially. So what I have spent most of my career doing is dedicating myself to the hormone normal physiology and physiologic challenges that women have from puberty all the way up through menopause. Um, for most of my career, I've been a fertility specialist, um, which spans reproductive age, but also gets into the perimenopausal phase because that's when women are sometimes trying to get that last hurrah in, you know, before right. their uh, reproductive window closes. But I see a lot of menopause as well because we see a lot of premature menopause, women in their 20s, 30s who are really? now menopausal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's more common than you'd think. Um, is when, when you're going through no something reason. like premenopause at such a, well, you were getting ready to say no reason, is a lot of it tied to lifestyle and nutrition? Not really. Most of the time, we don't find a reason. Um, if we do find a reason, it's often due to some genetic factor, you know, some chromosomal rearrangement or fragile X. Uh, fragile X is probably something a lot of people have heard of, don't really quite know what it is, but um, it's when you have a mutation or an alteration in a gene called the FMR gene on the X chromosome. And so what it is, it creates this instability in the chromosome, and that can lead to um, premature ovarian insufficiency. And it can be more severe in terms of behavioral and sort of like uh, developmental and social types of manifestations, almost like an autistic or Asperger type of manifestation. It's very varied, um, but Fragile X can often be responsible for women going into menopause sooner. Wow. What made you decide to switch from focusing on being a fertility specialist to focusing more on the endocrinology side of things and working going towards menopause and premenopause? Well, it's interesting. I have been an athlete my entire life. From the time I was seven years old, I was playing team sports. And so um, being an athlete has always been probably my first identity. I was an athlete before I was a physician. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's always been something. It's been my rock. It's been what I go to when I have a hard day. You know, it's it's my, I don't want to call it a crutch because that has like a negative connotation to it, but it's always been my security blanket, so to speak. You're it's non-negotiable. love to do. Exactly. It's a non-negotiable for me. And my husband will attest to that. Um, and so will my son. So that's always been there. And when I got to a certain point in my career, I said, you know what, I, I really want to do something with this. You know, I got established, I'm a partner in my practice. And um, I said, you know what, I got to bring fitness into this somehow. And so I became a, a Les Mills body combat instructor. That was the first thing I did. I was about 40 years old when I did that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't intend to teach at that point. I kind of just wanted to do the training, first of all, to see if I could do it, because it was really mm -hmm. hard. And and then I started teaching just was like, well, let's just try it. And then it just took off. I just had this love of connecting with other people and uh, about their fitness journeys. And so that led to becoming a body pump instructor, which then led to becoming a CrossFit trainer. And, you know, so it goes on, you know, since I've been 40, I've been a fitness professional as well, you know, 12 years later here I am. And so what was happening was I started training more and more clients like online mm -hmm. and with COVID and everything, that's kind of how it took off. And I was finding that most of the people that were coming to me were 40 and over. Um, you know, that's the age group I'm in. And right. I people want to connect, connect same to, thing. Like people, people, yeah, just like right. yourself. And then I realized, and you know, they're all going through perimenopause and, and menopause. I'm like, well, geez, I really should get a little more experience in this. And so I did the North American Menopause Society uh, certification. Um, there's an exam, but you also have to prepare, you have to study for the exam. So mm -hmm. I did some of the online training and I took the exam, I passed the exam. I mean, I had a great foundation for it as a reproductive endocrinologist. It was just some extensions into, sure. you know- Continued applying. education. It's continued education, yeah. just in a different group. So that's how I wound up um, with menopause. And then what happened was I was, you know, helping women to achieve, you know, their best performance in that age group. And then 
women of the reproductive age group were finding me. Like I had a woman who was in the Navy training for a special forces position, 23, 24 years old, having stress fractures, looking for help. And then the reproductive age people started coming to me for help with their performance. These were like firefighters, police. This, these were like high performing uh, occupation uh, types of women. And so then I said to myself, okay, so this looks like there's another niche here. And so what that led to was me putting my stick in the ground to be a women's performance endocrinologist. Uh, there was no area of endocrinology that dedicates itself to female athletic performance. And I decided that's what I was going to do. Um, so that's kind of how the whole thing evolved. That's that's awesome. Now, when women come to you and say, I want to get to x what's the difference well, i guess my question is what's the difference for training someone who's let's say 23 versus somebody who's 35 some of the challenges the same and some of them are different um the things that are the same is that body image is always an issue you know it's just our culture you know and i feel like though at 35 at 23 i feel like women and myself and probably you back then we acknowledge that. And at 23, it was like, I want to look good in a bathing suit. And then as we get older, we don't want to voice that that's one of our reasons or motivation. You know, we always say it's because I want to be healthy, but in the back of our head, we all, like you said, want to look better. And that is absolutely fine and okay, right. except when it interferes with our health and our performance right. excessively. And that leads into the other common denominator between those age groups is low energy availability. Mm -hmm. So when we're not feeling good about our body image, what's the first thing we do? We stop eating or we decrease our food intake and we start training harder. And so what that creates is an imbalance of your uh, energy coming in uh, not feeling the energy going out sufficiently. And so what happens to us as women, and we are particularly sensitive to this, it's a, it's a biological innate um, uh, mechanism to protect us where if the body senses, okay, I'm not getting enough food, there must be a famine, okay? Because your body doesn't know the difference between you just kind of wanting to shed a few pounds and the famine that's looming. It thinks there's a famine. So what happens is in, when you're in low energy availability, the body hangs on to more fat. So it actually makes things worse. So for younger women, the same thing happens. For older women, it's even more so. Um, because at this later stage of our lives, our bodies are trying to hang on to more fat because it protects our bones. So Mother Nature kind of had this programmed in, but it, it happens even in younger women too. Um, but there's a lot of other consequences too. There's you know declining muscle mass and just crappy performance and brain fog and all of that other stuff. Um, but is there a the natural body decrease image, in any hormones from 20 to 35 that would also have an effect? Not typically because women are still cycling naturally, you know, monthly, if they have normal menstrual cycles, if they don't have polycystic ovarian syndrome, you know, if they don't have any, any pathology, mm -hmm. you're cycling pretty regularly, mostly typical mm -hmm. woman, um, into your early to mid forties. And then that's when it usually starts to change. That's when you start seeing changes in the hormones and the ovarian function starting to decline. And then you have that perimenopause transition, but between 20 and 30, there really isn't that much of a difference. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, like I said, the, the body image issues ranges from a lot of things, you know, uh, with a lot of the elite athletes that I've seen, it's like their sponsors want them to look a certain way, but sure. for some athletes to look a certain way, they have to sacrifice their performance because it requires that they eat or they cut or they do various things mm -hmm. that aren't most favorable for their performance. And I mean, they're elite athletes, they're professionals, they're perform that is, that's what they do. The, the, right. and, and so there's a conflict there when their sponsor wants them to look a certain way, but their athletic performance demands that body composition may be a little bit different. And okay. so I see some of that as well. And that's a huge struggle for women who are professionals. So how do you go about navigating that? Because I feel like if it's a sponsor issue, it's either say, hey, sponsors, this is what I'm supposed to look like if you want me to perform, or I guess I'm not going to get paid because the sponsor is going to let me go if I don't look like X, Y, Z. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a couple ways to approach it. One is more on a macro 37,000 foot level, which is mm -hmm. we got to change this cultural perception right. that leaner is fitter mm -hmm. for everybody. Cause it's just not, 
Um, there are a lot of women who have to run a little smoother to perform at their very best. And there's it's a lot of it is just cultural, you know, it's just these leftover ideals, you know, that were carved out by somebody uh, that is supposed to, every woman is supposed to fit into. Right. And so when when culture decides or when society decides we're not having that anymore, then it'll change. Um, but right now, it exists and uh, it's hard to break that mold. So dealing with it on a macro level is, you know, podcasts such as this one, other podcasts that I've done too, just, you know, the global movement is to try to move away from that, that ideology. Um, from, you know, when I'm seeing an athlete, you really have to help them with their headspace. You know, you mm -hmm. have to, you have to just work them through it. What is most important to you? You know, um, if right. they're asking you to do something that's really going to impact your performance, then maybe this isn't the right sponsor for you. Um, you know, it's just helping yeah. them to work through some of those challenges on an individual level. Exactly. And when it comes to actually training for women, I know that you are a CrossFit coach, you've done body pump and all, obviously those are super intense regiments of training what are your thoughts and philosophies on women who train at intense levels? Because I feel like over the past year or two, I've been reading a lot of data, not data, people, I should say influencers mm -hmm. that say, oh my gosh, high intensity training for women, not good. Now it's, I am all about uh, high intensity training. It's what I've done for 20 years, but I would love to hear your take on that. Well, I mean, out of context, you know, just taking the sentence high intensity you know, workouts for women is not good, is just flat out wrong. The right. only way you can improve fitness is to gain intensity in what you're doing. You know, right. I mean, that's just, it's like, you know, gravity pulls Progressive overload, down. right? <laughs> you know, this is, this is a, a, a law of physics. You know, you can't achieve fitness without intensity. You just can't. But what changes throughout our lives is how you manage the aftermath. So we all talk about, you know, you, you hear these same influencers talk about cortisol and cortisol is bad. We have to stop demonizing cortisol. We're demonizing cortisol like we've been demonizing carbohydrates. You have two things that are so essential to life. If you didn't have cortisol, you would die. That's a disease called Addison's disease. It's when the adrenal glands can't produce cortisol. If you don't have carbohydrates, you sure you could be keto for a short period of time, but that's not going to sustain you for a long, healthy life. So it's it's ironic that the things that are essential to life somehow our culture culture finds a way to demonize it. So same with like insulin. I mean, people like you need insulin in your body, and people are like I don't want my blood sugars right. to increase my insulin. Exactly, levels. that's exactly true. I'm waiting for someone to come out and demonize water. That's going to be nuts. <laughs> don't drink water; it's bad for you. Um, but anyway. You have to manage your cortisol, just like you have to manage your carbohydrates. You don't want to eat a dozen donuts. That's bad. Right. Um, but you can have a donut every once in a while. That's okay. With cortisol, you need that cortisol drive to help you work out so that you can get fitter. But what you have to do is manage it afterwards. You have mm -hmm. to return that fight or flight system back to baseline so that you can recover. So it's not that you have to deal with the front end. You really have to deal with the back end. Now, of course, on the front end, you don't want to train excessively. You want to balance nutrition and training. That's not what we're talking about. We're mm -hmm. talking about just, you know, getting your intense workouts in for the purpose of getting fitter. With cortisol, you have to manage it by getting it into its baseline. And that's, you do that by not overtraining. You do that by appropriate sleep, recovery, mobility work, tissue care, and also meditation, mindset, yoga, dealing with all of the outside world stressors that are driving up your cortisol. So you have to manage that. You don't avoid intensity. You pay attention to what happens after the workout. And that's probably the biggest mistake out there um, that is being made by the cortisol demonizers is that you don't realize that you need that cortisol to get fitter. You need intensity to get fitter and you're going to die on the vine if you avoid it. That's just right. the simple, hard biological truth. Yeah. I actually just ran a 50 K race this weekend and I am loving recovery week. <laughs> yeah. Right. I need uh, more than a week if I did that, my goodness, but that's awesome. Unfortunately, the job doesn't let me take more than a week, but yes, for sure. 
No, I'm yeah, right. and it's all right. how you manage that. And and when you deal with midlife women, so midlife women, you know, forty plus, we have a special challenge because as our estrogen is declining, that buffer of managing that cortisol response and that stress response is depleted, and so it we're a little bit more sensitive to those increases in cortisol. So again, that doesn't mean you avoid it. It means that, okay, if I'm going to run a 5K today and do it in my fastest time, I at 52 years old need to make sure I might do 30 minutes of yoga, get a little more protein and go to bed a little bit earlier where my 22 year old self would run that 5K, come home, eat like crap and go out with my friends and party at 11 o'clock at night. And I'd still be able to go to the gym the next day. So when you're older, you just have to pay more attention to your recovery. Mm -hmm. Don't let up on that intensity because you need that to get fitter, Mm -hmm. but pay more attention to that recovery after the fact. And and like I said, midlife women are a bit more vulnerable to that, but that doesn't mean to avoid it. It just means pay more attention to the, the back end of it. Now, as you start to get older and you start to experience some of the premenopausal symptoms of hot flashes or mood swings, constipation, soreness, fatigue, all those sorts of things, I know that you are so focused on holistic health. What are some natural things that you can do for your body to kind of get through that period? Luckily, I'm not there yet. I don't know how far I am away from it, but I know a lot of listeners are. (laughs) Sure. I think sleep is the most important first thing to focus on um, Mm -hmm. because that's where your recovery happens. That's where Mm -hmm. most of your recovery happens. You can't have recovery without sleep. It's very, very hard. Um, So, and that's probably one of the biggest struggles that midlife women have is because when hormones start fluctuating, excuse me, you get those hot flashes and you get, you know, other symptoms too. Um, You know, that, that, that wake up at 3 AM is, is just a killer. Um, So it helps to, instead of panicking about it, take a breath and take a look at, okay, how, you know, what time do I get to bed? What time do I get up? How do I improve my pre-bedtime routine? Um, Maybe I need to keep the room a little bit cooler. Maybe the dog has to sleep on the floor, maybe instead of coming into our bed. Uh, Turn off the tech. And I'm terrible at this. I've been known to fall asleep with my phone in hand. Um, But (laughs) typically falling asleep isn't my problem. My problem is waking up later on. Mm -hmm. Um, Meditation is really key if you're one of those people that wakes up at 3 a.m. for the day. Um, This was a a a, a lifesaver for me um, because that's my issue. And probably 80% of the time I can get back to sleep with some meditation techniques. So it's learning you know, be, being objective about looking at your sleep patterns and making meaningful change. Um, that's the first step. And then nutrition, I think, is second. Again, in this stage of life, we start to deplete ourselves because we see those body composition changes. And then, you know, our body thinks it's starving and that is not good for recovery either. Mm-hmm. Um, big thing that midlife women don't get enough of is protein. Protein is so, so important during this time when our muscles are starting to uh, I don't want to say degrade, that's a little bit strong, but we do start to lose muscle mass. We do start to lose bone density and you need protein to mitigate those losses. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are probably the two big go-tos is sleep and nutrition. Um, now, do we start to lose those. muscle and bone because of aging and hormones or is it also, or is it because of, as we get older, we also kind of start to decrease our focus on exercise. Maybe you're not lifting as much or as regularly as you get older, um, or is it the hormonal effects? It's a combination of things. I mean, if we look at men, um, they lose muscle mass and bone mass with age, not as dramatically as women. And the reason why it's not as dramatic as women is because they don't cycle. Uh, they don't have a menstrual cycle. Mm-hmm. Imagine if men had a menstrual cycle. Oh my goodness. Uh, I shudder to think, but women do. And because there are estrogen receptors, those are the little antennae on tissue that pick up the estrogen hormone signal. Mm -hmm. Those receptors start to be depleted. And in midlife, the estrogen levels and the the hormone levels also are depleting. And so the muscle and bone are kind of looking around for estrogen, where is it? And they're not seeing it anymore. And so we know, because at the onset of menopause, once periods stop for good, we see a rapid decline in bone density loss. Um, and in muscle mass. And that is hormonal. 
And mm -hmm. so you see that sharp drop off because of the hormonal factors. You will see it decline with age. Mm -hmm. And many times, you know, if you're not sleeping great, if your joints are hurting, you may not be inclined to be as active as you once were. I mm -hmm. think that's more true in the general population. But if you take avid recreational athletes yeah. and, you know, the elite levels, they're not slowing down. Um, and they, and, you know, nor should they, mm -hmm. uh, but those same physiological processes are happening regardless of the activity. But I mm -hmm. think in the general population, you have age, you have hormones and you have more sedentary behavior mm -hmm. because they just don't feel like working out anymore, or maybe job demands, family demands aren't uh, making it so easy to do. If you have a hysterectomy, this just popped into my head. If you had a hysterectomy, let's say when you're 25, do you start to have those symptoms then? If, if you have your well. ovaries removed, yes. A hysterectomy mm -hmm. um, technically is just removal of the uterus. Mm -hmm. A hysterectomy with a bilateral ovarectomy, which means bilateral ovarian um, removal, then yes, you are going to experience those symptoms of menopause very dramatically and very quickly because, because you remove the ovaries, the estrogen shuts off like a light switch. Mm -hmm. So that's very, very difficult for these women. And so what we try to do in women like that is we start them on hormones right away. That's uh, exactly and it's what I was birth control pills. That's all they really need to take to help mm -hmm. prevent cardiovascular disease, the cognitive defects, the uh, not defects, but the cognitive decline and uh, mm -hmm. keeps their bones and muscles healthy as well. What is the average age nowadays for women to start going through uh, premenopause or just starting the menopausal symptoms and then actual menopause? Most women start the transition around age 45. And okay. then by age 52 in America, uh, that's Caucasians. Um, that's what the studies uh, focus on. Different ethnic groups undergo menopause at different ages, but it's in and around 52 mm -hmm. um, in the United States. That's when periods, that's one year beyond when periods have stopped for good. Uh, mm -hmm. But that transition in most women starts in the mid 40s, anywhere between, you know, 44, 46 years old. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend hormonal therapy for natural occurring menopause as well? It depends. It depends on what the symptoms are. Uh -huh. um, you don't, not everybody needs hormone therapy. The only exception to that is in women who are well under the age of menopause, who have had chemotherapy or their ovaries surgically removed or who have gone into natural menopause before the age of 40. Those women, yes, it is the standard of care to put them on birth control pills. But that premature menopause is a totally different biological process. You can't even have the same conversation as with women who undergo menopause at the physiologic age. Mm -hmm. um, and women who undergo menopause at the physiologic age they don't all need hormone therapy. It's mm -hmm. out there for certain symptoms that you might have. If you're having hot flashes, hormone therapy is the most effective treatment for hot flashes. It has been FDA approved for osteoporosis prevention, um, vaginal dryness in some of the uh, genital and urinary symptoms of menopause. We have local vaginal estrogen therapy that we can use for that. So it really depends on the symptoms. Um, gotcha. The data is very clear that you just don't start hormones for, you know, well, I just, just kind of want to maintain this and prevent sure. disease. There's yeah. a lot of data against that. Um, but if you have specific symptoms <clears throat> and the risk benefit equation makes sense, because there are risks to hormone therapy as well. Mm -hmm. if, if the risk benefit equation makes sense, then yeah, it's available. And I do recommend it. Mm -hmm. My mom had a full hysterectomy due to endometriosis with her ovaries removed. And obviously, because it's, like you said, it's like one day you're fine. The next thing, everything is gone. And if she did not, this was back in the, they didn't do birth control for her hormones. It was, she actually had like the hormonal patch and bless her heart. We'd be like, mom, you don't have your patch on today. Go put, like, it was such a telling event. We'd be like, you need to go do something with yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. And young women, it's really dramatic, which is why we really do try to get them started on something quickly. Um, yeah. because it's miserable going through it when it's that cut and dry, you know, ovaries are there one day and they're not the next. Yeah, exactly. What are your thoughts on tailoring your workouts to where you are in your cycle? That's also been a very popular thing lately of your Yeah, phases. I think it's the cutting edge. I, I think it's the yeah. cutting edge to help the elite athletes and, you know, women, avid recreational athletes to really try to, to perform at their best. Um, you know, Stacey Sims does a lot of fantastic work in this. And I, I 
try to learn from her because, you know, the exercise science is, is really her jam. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she has a good handle on knowledge of the menstrual cycle and applying her expertise in how we, how we metabolize different, you know, fuel sources, whether it be fats or carbohydrates changes, mm -hmm. depending on what the hormones are doing in the cycle. Um, you know, whether or not you can, you know, train intensely in the first 10 days and then maybe do some mobility work and other stuff in the, you know, the, the, the days leading up to your period, um, there's real truth to it. There's real science to it. And it is, can you kind of break that down real fast? Kind of so at yeah, the start I can of your try. cycle, I can try. Yeah. sure. So the menstrual cycle is divided basically into two phases, the follicular phase, which is the first 14 days, and then the luteal phase, which is essentially the last 14 days. And at day 14, the reason why the dividing line goes down to day 14 is because around day 14 is when ovulation happens. Okay. Now, women's menstrual cycles are very variable. Not everybody ovulates exactly on day 14. It varies, but essentially before ovulation is a follicular phase, after ovulation is a luteal phase. Before ovulation, the body is primed because the, the hormones are on the lower side. They're not trying to do anything. They're not trying to ovulate an egg. They're not trying to develop the uterine lining. They're kind of just hanging out, ready to perform. And so those are the days where you can do your heavy lifts. Those are the days where you can do your explosive training uh, because your body utilizes carbohydrates very, very efficiently during that phase. When it comes time to mid-cycle ovulation, this is when hormones are starting to go up. This is when your estrogen levels are rising, when ovulation happens and the progesterone rises too. So around that time, you are metabolizing carbohydrates and fats a little bit differently. So maybe higher volume, less load is a better way to go uh, during that phase. And then as time ticks on, as the uterine lining is now developing, when implantation can happen, the body is very occupied with trying to prepare for implantation. So this isn't the time to be doing your one rep max deadlift because the body's like, hey, I'm busy because the uterus needs to be ready for implantation. And so that's when you can focus on your restorative sorts of active recovery workouts. Maybe that's where you do your, your base training if you're a runner. This is maybe where you do your mobility training if you're a power lifter or a weight lifter. Mm -hmm. um, because you need to do that anyway. And so right. then, you know, if pregnancy doesn't happen, you're right back to where you started again. So those are some basics. I've really oversimplified it. Like I said, Stacey Sims does some great, great work on this. Um, but those are the basics. I've actually have reached out to her. So I'm hoping to have her on the show as well. Um, oh, yeah, she, for she'd sure. be a great addition. Yes, I read her book years and years ago with one of them. Um, what about women who are on birth control since their cycles don't quite work the same, obviously, do they need to focus on that? Well, you have to focus on it a little differently because when you're on birth control pills, you have a shorter period of time. And it's really the time when you go off the pill for the month to get your period, you have a much narrower window of time where you can benefit from those high intensity sorts of workouts. That doesn't mean you can't do them throughout the rest of the month. It just means that your body is not necessarily going to perform at its very best when you're on hormonal birth control. In the elite athlete space, the professionals, we try to keep them away from birth control pills because mm -hmm. when you're suppressing the cycle, the cycle is not doing what it wants to do. And when you're mm -hmm. fighting nature, nature can't fight for you, right? right? Nature cannot be at its peak physical potential when it's being suppressed. The reason why we can perform as well is when those hormones are cycling, but you try to suppress it, not gonna, they're not going to perform quite as well. And there's some science behind that too. So, you know, obviously, well, what do I do then if I, you know, if I, if I don't want to get pregnant and well, there's other things, there's progesterone mm -hmm. IUDs, which tend to be a little bit better. They do suppress ovulation for a little bit after you first put them in, but then that tapers off. And then you still cycle your hormones mm -hmm. cycle, but your uterus, your uterine lining just doesn't bleed, uh, which is fabulous. So that's really the optimal birth control uh, for female athletes who are really looking for that extra edge. Mm -hmm. What about copper? Uh, like I don't copper know IED. much about copper. No, <laughs> about copper? I know it's non-hormonal. <laughs> 
Oh, you mean the copper IUD? IUD, yes, yes. Oh, I'm like copper, like in general, as a penny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you stick a penny up there. Yeah, yeah right. Well, you know, that might work. Um, don't tell tell your listeners do not do not go do, home that. And do that. <laughs> That is, don't, please don't put a penny in your vagina. Dr. DiGirolamo did not tell you to do that. <laughs> anyway, a copper IUD. Yes, a copper IUD is fabulous because it's great contraception and you do still have your natural cycle. You do bleed every month though. And sometimes right. it can be crampy. Sometimes it can be heavy. Um, but to your point, yes, it's non-hormonal. So that is a fantastic method of birth control. Now this has, I know that we're starting to run on time and this could probably be an episode for a whole nother day, but since you are an endocrinologist and this is something that's been going on like crazy, what are your thoughts on people, men and women, using something like Manjaro or the other diabetes medicines for weight loss right now? You mean like metformin? Metformin like, is uh, one of them. Met, um, Manjaro is one of them as well. I, but, I'm not familiar with Manjaro. Um, I don't know what mechanism of action that is. Metformin is a um, it's an insulin sensitizing uh, type of agent, but you know, I'm not a fan of weight loss medication, honestly. Mm -hmm. Um, I think if you're morbidly obese, um, the obesity medicine doctors do this very well. They know how to use very effectively a combination of medication, diet, exercise, behavioral types of things. So I think there's definitely a role for these medications for weight loss in that space with a trained professional in that setting. But for the general, for the individual who maybe wants to shed 10 pounds and perform a little better, I don't recommend those kinds of medications. A good coach that can, you know, take a look at your nutrition and your training schedule is really what you would need to just shed a few, uh, you know, 10, 20 pounds. If you're obese, then maybe consider those in the context of um, other strategies under the care of a professional. Sure. Now, when women come to you and they're like, I just... Oh, doctor, I can't lose this weight. I'm gone through menopause. It just seems to stack on. There's nothing I can do. How do you also just motivate them to say, yes, you're not stuck how you are. Let's take care of your health. Let's take care of your body. I think getting them a coach, that is the key thing because, you know, as I, I could be the most inspiring prophet on the phone to these people, but it's a, it's a, it's a 45 minute visit. You know, it might stick with them. Something I say might stick for a week or two, but really it's a lifestyle change. Mm -hmm. And so I tell people there is tremendous value in getting a coach, even just for six weeks, somebody that can get you motivating and get you in new habits because mm -hmm. habits are what will carry the day. And those are the things you ultimately need to change if you're going to do anything sustainable. And that's really hard to do on your own. And I think so many people fail on their own because they don't have enough resource that's taking them through that day to day. And that's where I think a coach can really help. I am a huge advocate of coaches to help women make real change. Do you currently coach right now as well? I don't do any more ongoing coaching. Um, I have a lot of other things that have come along that have prevented me from doing that anymore. Uh, I do do consultations. What I do, I do performance consultations. So any woman who wants to sit down with me for 45 minutes, they fill out a questionnaire. Um, I take a look at what their situation is and I will sit with them <clears throat> for an hour, give them some resources. I have a lot of contacts in the industry where I can help, you know, give them some talking points for their physician, for their providers, and also point them in the right direction to have those ongoing resources. But mm -hmm. I do consultations. I just don't do the ongoing coaching. Sure. Do you recommend any certain supplements that all women should be taking, especially as we start to get older, just over the Creatine. counter? Creatine. I think creatine. Creatine is probably the most universal supplement that I recommend, uh, particularly for women, um, mm -hmm. especially midlife women, um, because again, your you know bone density is declining, muscle mass is declining, you know, as the ovarian function is declining, and you need every tool in the toolbox pulled out to try to mitigate that decline. And creatine is excellent for that. And there's some pretty good data out there. There is an investigator, his name is Darren Kandow, C-A-N-D-O-W. He is a creatine guru. And I've seen a lot of podcasts 
uh, with him in it. He's awesome. And so you can learn a ton about creatine, but it is the most well-studied. It is one of the safest supplements you can take and it is effective. Um, so that's probably the single one I would recommend um, all women to take. Obviously, check with your physician if you've got some bizarre kidney thing going on. Maybe you, it's not for you, uh, but you always want to check. Um, that's really the big one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, getting enough protein, like I said, if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, sometimes it's hard to get all that, you know, to get that adequate amount of protein. The adequate amount, according to Stacey Sims and some others, is one gram of protein per pound of body weight, mm -hmm. um, especially in midlife and beyond. Some people can't get that on a vegan or vegetarian diet. And so I think a good high quality protein supplement is a must for those people. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree with both of those recommendations. And then as far as your personal website is concerned, I know that you have two very awesome newsletters to choose from. So please blast out there, post whatever you would like and say whatever you'd like to say about them. But I am on your list. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. So thank you for subscribing. So I have two newsletters. Uh, the first one is called Athletic Aging, and that's athleticaging, all one word, dot blog. And that is specifically for uh, midlife women, women basically 40 plus or going through that menopause transition and for menopausal women. And so that newsletter has a workout of the week. Are you doing my workouts, Kendall? <laughs> I I am not because I designed uh, 10 workouts caught. every week. For myself. You're busted. You're busted. Yeah. <laughs> um, there was a workout every Monday. Um, and then every other Thursday, it could be content on review of medical literature, which I try to dissect and put into layman's terms so that people can understand it. Other articles that I may write. The second um, newsletter, I just launched it um, a couple of months ago. I think it was February or March 1st that I launched it. It was February. Um, that's called Performance Edge. And what that is, is a newsletter for high performing women. These could be firefighters, police, athletes, CEOs of companies. Even if you're not an elite athlete or a firefighter, if you're a CEO and you've got that kind of stress going on, you are a high performing woman and you are in the same same category as the physical high performers. So if you're a high performing woman of any age, then this newsletter is for you. And I try to help people understand what's going on with their physiology, their menstrual cycle, what happens when things go wrong and how to optimize performance at, at any age. So uh, that one is performanceedge.blog, all one word. And the other is athleticaging.blog. Love it. And I'm actually on the performance edge. <laughs> oh, good. Yes. Yes. <laughs> because let me tell you, I am one stressed out woman. <laughs> yeah. And, and managing it's key. It really is. You know, I, I think a lot of people don't really speak to the stress response as a whole because it is mm -hmm. so complicated from, you know, as an endocrinologist, I look at these pathways as like nature is just you know, so complex. And these pathways are very complex. I had to go to school for 100 years to understand these pathways. Right. And, and so I think, you know, a lot of the misconceptions out there about cortisol and some of these other things are just not really having a solid understanding of the role of these pathways, mm -hmm. the good parts of it, and the parts of it that need to be tempered. And that balance is really where the Holy Grail is. And, um, and understanding those pathways is, uh, it's not easy, but it's well worth it because that's how you can really tap into athletic performing potential. And we live in this culture of like the hustle culture, right? Where it's yes. like being stressed all the time and working 18 hour days is something that we're supposed to be proud of. Yeah. And that's really not something that I'm proud of. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I give them, you know, I'm a Gen Xer and uh -huh. I give the millennials so much credit because they basically stood up to the boomers and the Gen Xers and says, you know what, we're not having this. You know, we're just, this is just not for us. Work-life balance is the way to go. And I'll tell you, I'm I, a, gen, I, I'm a millennial and I'm not, I'm still working on that part. <laughs> yeah. Right. But you know, in the Gen Wires, you know, they've, uh, they followed suit and my son who's a Gen Z has totally mm -hmm. eased into that whole mentality <laughs> about uh, work-life balance, more life balance than work. But uh, but yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely something that is changing in our culture, but we do, and we have other stressors, you know, if it's not that we're working 18 hours a day or 10 hours a day, it's, it's something else that's right. stressing us out. Um, and so either way, no matter what is happening in our culture, there's always going to be stressors to manage. 
That's right. So you guys go get on her newsletter so you can learn how to manage your stress. Take care of yourself. <laughs> well, Dr. Carla, thank you so much. Everyone can also go to your website, which is just drcarlad.com, right? And it yes. has access to both of those newsletters right there. And yep. that's also your Instagram. Uh, yeah, it's Dr. Underscore Carla underscore D is my Instagram handle. Gotcha. Now, does your husband ever try to, like, has he ever tried to ask if he could have your last name since you didn't take his? <laughs> I suggested that to him once, but that kind of went over like a lead balloon. The best <laughs> I could do, I made my last name my son's middle name. So okay, uh, I, I got a win there. There you go. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with me. I actually have to get back to the gym and knock out my afternoon workout, but I really appreciate this. This was a great learning experience. And I know everyone listening right now will think the same thing. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to your listeners and uh, go crush that workout. How awesome is Dr. Carla? She is so fun to talk to, so easy to talk to. And I hope that you're walking away from this conversation going, huh, I learned a thing or two. Now, just a quick reminder, if you want to hang out and you want to learn more about me and how I can help you, check out fitwomensweekly.com. All of my notes are down below, um, as well as other ways that you can help support Fit Women's Weekly with links to social media, Instagram, TikTok, all the things. And if you have a question or a topic you would like covered, ask that down below, and I would be happy to answer it in a future episode. Or if it's a shorter question, I'll be happy to answer it down in the comments. And then the last thing I would love to know is how old are you right now? And how do you feel that your training has changed over the past 10 years if you've been working out regularly for that amount of time? If you haven't, let me know just how is your fitness going right now? Are you where you want to be? What are some of your goals? I would love to hear it. Uh, and just see where you are right now in life. All right, guys, thank you so much for hanging out with me. Bye.